Welcome to CBS News Primetime. I'm John Dickerson. The voting has taken place. The counting has started. We're going to all come back. They're all coming back. And I think you see that here. I love this country. And we're going to go and fight until the very last poll closes. Okay, New Hampshire, you're up. Republican primary results soon from the Granite State. The biggest one-day toll of Israeli casualties in its war with Hamas as the U.S. launches new strikes on Iraq. This is Sunday morning. And our goodbye to CBS legend Charles Osgood. People can listen to a newscast and come away thinking, boy, this is a terrible time to be alive. That's not the whole story. Hello, thank you for being with us. We begin in New Hampshire, where some of the polls have closed. In one hour, all polls will close, and results will start to tell the story of the evening from the first state primary of the 2024 election. The field is a tiny one by historical standards for this stage of the race. In 2016, there were seven competitors in the GOP field. Now, only Donald Trump and Nikki Haley are competing. Trump's victory in Iowa last week was so commanding, he bounced the once formidable Florida Governor Ron DeSantis from the race after a mere one contest. 22 delegates will be awarded proportionally tonight, and Nikki Haley hopes she'll be around long enough for that to matter, because the final delegate tally at the end of the primary season is a lifetime away. The immediate threat comes from a party base and elected officials who have lined up behind the former president and see him as a shoe in so I'm running against Donald Trump, and I'm not going to talk about an obituary just because y'all think we have to talk about it. I'm going to talk about running the tape and saving this country. I would never ask anybody to pull out. I didn't ask Ron to pull out. I didn't ask Vivek to pull out. Nobody. But we have great support, and most of the people that pulled out have already supported me. We've got almost enough reporters on the ground to field a football team in there across the state. And our Anthony Salvanto is here watching the numbers in New York at the data desk. But we start with our chief Washington correspondent, Major Garrett, and our chief election and campaign correspondent, Robert Costa, in Manchester. And joined by White House and political correspondent, Ed O'Keefe, who is at a Trump watch party in Nashua. Major, I'll start with you as we await results. What are you mm -hmm. looking for? Uh, two things, John. Uh, numbers and lyrics, if you will. Here's on the number side. Not only the turnout, but the composition. In New Hampshire, as you well know, the largest block of voters is undeclared. There are about 344,000 undeclared voters in New Hampshire compared to about 267,000 registered Republicans. And if turnout is, as projections currently indicate, above 300,000 or maybe 320, maybe 330,000, is there a composition of undeclared there that provide a secret boost of fuel for Nikki Haley to get more competitive to former President Trump, who is clearly the front runner. Okay, that's the numbers. What do I mean by lyrics? Nikki Haley, and this is worth spending a second to consider, she said, my goal is to make this a two-person race weeks and weeks ago. She's done that. All right, what are you going to do with this one-on-one -on -one confrontation with the former president? What are your lyrics going to be mm -hmm. from New Hampshire to galvanize people about the importance of this race and why you are a better alternative than the former president? Because she's going to be attacked and attacked aggressively in South Carolina, more so than she was here. What are your lyrics going to be to tell voters you are the better choice? Major, you've set up the next question for me nicely to Bob, which is Bob. It's been hard for challengers to weaken Donald Trump. But uh, the argument, the theory was, if it came down to a two-person race, then perhaps the case could be made against him. Is there any argument that Haley has made that has been successful along those lines or that looked like it might become successful if uh, she can make it past New Hampshire? John, great to be with you here on election night. It's evident to me, based on our reporting at CBS in recent days, that the Haley argument you're talking about has been evolving. For so many weeks, we've heard about Haley talking about the, quote, chaos around former President Donald Trump. Now she has sharpened her attack, and she is talking about what she perceives as Trump's decline mentally, politically, physically. She's casting it in a broad sense, but she's talking about decline. And she's saying to Republican voters at this crucial crossroads, do you really want to have a nominee who is making mistakes on stage? Uh, if he's going to run against President Biden, who's over age 80, do you want to have a standard bearer who's making mistakes in calling me Nancy Pelosi instead of Nikki Haley? Do you want a standard bearer who's going to face two federal trials potentially later this year? 
It's a sharper attack. We'll see if it works in a state like New Hampshire and whether it's enough to elevate her into South Carolina, but more importantly, if it keeps her in the race until Super Tuesday. South Carolina is going to be tough. Even if she has a great night here, that's Trump country. Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina was talking with Major and I earlier today about that. At the same time, there are states on Super Tuesday in early March, like Colorado, Virginia, Utah, she could possibly play in if she gets a bit of a bump out of New Hampshire. Ed, what struck you about the electorate in New Hampshire as you've seen it there compared with what we saw last week in Iowa? A few things, John. Uh, as expected, this is a far less MAGA-centric or Trump-loving electorate. Only about a third of voters who showed up today based on the early exit polls uh, described themselves as MAGA, or the Make America Great Again movement that surrounds the former president. 45% of voters here, independents. That's far more than participated in Iowa's caucuses last week. Uh, the other thing is, once again, we're getting confirmation. Voters are angry, incredibly dissatisfied with the direction of the country. About 45% saying dissatisfied, 32%, a third, essentially, saying they're angry about the direction mm. of the country. Uh, and also, there's much more skepticism in this state, John about whether or not Donald Trump would be fit to serve as president if he is convicted of a crime in the coming months in the midst of this campaign. All of this is important to the broader general election focus and argument that Nikki Haley and Chris Sununu have been making here in New Hampshire. He can't win states like New Hampshire. He lost narrowly in 2016. He lost it in 2020 to President Biden. And the argument they're making and now what the exit polling is showing us is he may have the same exact problem again and fail to win the four electoral votes here from the Granite State. Major, we're going to hear the words moderate and conservative all night. Those words have been really scrambled. Can you give us a quick definition of what those words mean to you so we know what we're talking about? Well, moderate has sort of become a way of describing someone who is not MAGA-centric or tightly aligned with former President Trump. And there's lots of other more, far more disparaging names. Rhino, Republican in name only, globalist weakling. Anyone who's not in the Trump orbit is disparaged by Trump and those close to him as not only insufficiently Republican, but insufficiently loyal to Trump. They don't get it. They don't understand how to fight. On the MAGA side, and we see it in exit polling here, just like we saw in Iowa, what's the number one characteristic people like about Trump? Fights for someone like me. That fighter edge that Trump brings to not only rhetoric but to campaigning is definitional for his supporters. And what Nikki Haley has to do here and elsewhere is say, yes, I can fight, but I won't be as hobbled by other things, like Bob Costa mentioned, that inevitably the former president will have to combat, whether he wants to or not. Those realities, legal, criminal, civil, are not going away. We need a clean argument against Biden. And Haley is saying, I can be one to wage that clean fight against Biden. And Bob, as time runs out here, what does Nikki Haley face if she does well enough to go and get some kind of a little boost out of New Hampshire? What's she going to face from Trump? She's going to face a barrage of attacks, and she's going to face a Republican Party that's largely in Trump's grip already, urging her to coalesce around Trump to get out of the race. But for Nikki Haley, this is a, a crossroads personally and historically. So often in presidential politics, John, as you've documented over the years in your books and reporting, you only have one shot. And if you don't take that shot and really try to push yourself toward the nomination and fight it out, then you may never get that shot again. World events change, people change, parties change. And for now, she is in the sweet spot for the first time in her political career as the person who could be the leader of the traditional Republican wing inside the GOP nationally. She has always been orbiting that role, but right now she is in the race for president as someone who could say to the rest of the party that doesn't like Trump, I'm for you, I can bring women, independents, and others into this coalition. The question I always have for any politician I cover is, how much political pain are you willing to tolerate? Can you take a 15, 20 point blow out in South Carolina and then go into Super Tuesday? Can you wait for those federal trials to start and keep making the case against Trump, trudging through all these different states across the country? It's a hard case to make for someone who's politically young, like Ambassador Haley, who has likely future runs in her. But what does she really want to do? Only Nikki Haley can answer that question. Pain threshold, a great question. Quickly to you, Ed, you cover the Biden White House. Would they rather this race be over, make it a two-man race with Donald Trump, or See, the Republicans have a big, zesty fight full of uh, possible ammunition that Biden could use later. 
They wouldn't mind that, but they concede that if it's a big win by the president, the former president tonight here in New Hampshire, the general election effectively begins tomorrow. And they've got a $120 million war chest ready to go across the country as needed. You saw this joint rally he held with the vice president today in Virginia, focused on the issue of abortion rights, but overtaken by protesters in the room concerned about the situation in the Middle East. That's something he's going to continue to face from his base. The other thing they, they keep an eye on, uh, or, or the other thing that we're now watching, a bit of a shakeup. This is traditional. Senior aide from the West Wing, Mike Donilon, his speechwriter, and Jennifer O'Malley Dillon, who's been running operations for the West Wing ever since she ran the 2020 campaign, are now being sent from Washington to Wilmington to run the advertising in the case of Donilon. He's written some of the president's best ads and speeches, or most effective ones, at least people would say. And then O'Malley Dillon will focus on the nuts and bolts of getting the 270 electoral votes. A critical thing in this season where battleground states like Michigan may be on the bubble, given the situation in the Middle East and growing concern among Democrats there. Major Garrett, Robert Costa, and Ed O'Keefe, thank you to all three of you. Great stuff. For more, let's bring in CBS News Executive Director of Elections and Surveys, Anthony Salvanto. Anthony, it's good to be back with you again. So, we've got some polls that are closed. Help us understand what we can see or know at this period, because obviously some voting is still going on in New Hampshire. It, it is, but we've been talking to people as they're leaving the polling place all day, and a couple of things stand out. One is, and you mentioned it in the first segment, this split on whether or not people think Donald Trump would be fit to be president if convicted of a crime. This is defining in many ways, right? You might expect people who say no to be more for Nikki Haley. At least that's what we would have expected based on the pre-election polling. So we're going to watch these numbers and see if that, in fact, shapes up tonight. But the other thing I need to say here is that this is very different than it was in Iowa. In the Iowa case, this was about two-thirds who said yes. That's a much more right-leaning, that's a much more MAGA electorate, and that's a big part of it. And the other part of this, John, is when you look at the differences in why people are voting for their candidate, I'm going to start with this, with Haley. Her number one answer is, has the right temperament. And that echoes some of what we've been seeing in the last week on the campaign trail, right? Her talking about, uh, of that, about that, about temperament, contrasting herself to Donald Trump, maybe some campaign effects there. Whereas Donald Trump, this is more of the same. His top response among his voters is that he fights for people like me. And that's part of that larger narrative that we've seen, where even things like his indictments, his voters tell us, just pushes them to support him more, seeing, them as, seeing him as somebody not just fighting for them, but also taking it very personally and seeing it all as politically motivated. So those, those are some of the big attitudinal splits that I think we need to watch tonight, John. So at the end of tonight, Anthony, we're going to have some ideas about what happened in New Hampshire, and we're going to have what we know happened in Iowa. Is there a way to think intelligently about those two sets of numbers as people make judgments about what the Republican Party looks like um, and what uh, kind of how to try not to fall into the trap of thinking the entire party is determined by just the participants, but also recognizing that the participants in the caucus and the primary have a real sway over the shape and direction of a party. That's a I lot to you, ask you. Well, I think you set up the two states traditionally as two different tests. The first test in Iowa is a test of can you appeal to the most ideological part of your base. Historically, that's what Iowa is. It's why Iowa has not always picked the eventual nominee, but it also sets up as an organizing test. And you saw that last week with support for Donald Trump, the higher numbers who say they're part of the MAGA movement. That's an identity affiliation there. But then compare the New Hampshire primary, which is traditionally set up as can you win among a broader electorate? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, this nominee has to go on to the general. So the fact that there are a lot more independents in New Hampshire is often seen as a test of that broader electability. And if Nikki Haley does well among independents, that would probably at least politically bolster her claim, as she's been making against the former president, that she fares better against Joe Biden. So two different states, two different electorates, and two different political tests. And the central question of the Republican Party, nicely teed up, Anthony. Anthony Salmanto, we will be checking back in with you in a bit. Thanks. A reminder, we will have continuing coverage of the New Hampshire primary throughout the evening with a special edition of America Decides at 8 p.m. Eastern and CBS News Primetime, that's us, at 10. We'll have a lot more on New Hampshire this hour, but also we're following some other news tonight, including Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's first public comment since his hospitalization and new developments on Donald Trump's gag order in his federal election case. Those headlines 
Plus, some other news around the world. Those are coming up next. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. Polls close in New Hampshire in about 45 minutes. Republican voters are eager to see if former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley can stay competitive against former President Donald Trump or if the country is more likely headed for a Trump-Biden rematch in November. CBS News political correspondent Caitlin Huey Burns joins me now from Nikki Haley's campaign headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire. Caitlin, good to see you. Uh, how are the voters you're, you've spoken to feeling tonight about, well, what's going to happen in this uh, primary? Hey, John, good to be with you. Well, voters we've been speaking to all week are very dissatisfied with their choices, to say the least. But voters that I spoke to coming off of the polls felt that this race really boiled down to either support for Donald Trump or fueled by opposition to him. Now, there are two candidates in this race, Donald Trump and Nikki Haley. And I talked to many different kinds of voters who were supporting Nikki Haley as a way to slow Donald Trump or to announce an opposition to him. Has Haley, you've been watching Haley um, in this campaign. Has she said anything that struck you as resonant with actual new, with New Hampshire voters uh, in the context of what you just described as voters are listening to her. Well, John, it was really in, only in the last couple of days that she became more aggressive in going after Donald Trump and independent voters that we spoke to who were supporting her. A lot of them told us they wanted her to be more aggressive. She, in the final days, was questioning his mental fitness, but also acknowledged that, you know, he still uh, was fit to be president. And that's kind of been the needle she's been threading. We talk a lot about independent voters here that she needs to attract. Well, she also needs to turn out some Republican-based voters as well. So she's been trying to toe the line between criticizing Donald Trump but not going too far. And the question of this campaign, depending on the results, is whether that strategy was the right one. We talked uh, last night about the enthusiasm in New Hampshire. Um, what have you seen? It looks like uh, preliminary indications looks like people were pretty enthusiastic. Um, what's, your, what's it look like for you today? Because it does give us some idea about um, this Republican base, however it may be formed, their enthusiasm to participate. John, a couple of different anecdotes from a polling location I was in earlier at a, in a very Republican-heavy area. I talked to several independents. One was an 89-year-old woman who says she rarely leaves her house but was determined to make it out today to vote for Nikki Haley because she wanted to cast a vote against Donald Trump. She was there with her daughter and her walker, and she made it to the polls. Another group of voters I spoke with were independents, uh, and one was Republican, and all of uh, the independents told me they had never once before voted for a Republican until today, and they were voting for Nikki Haley. So the Haley support here seems really fueled mm. by a strong opposition to Donald Trump. Does that outweigh, however, those who came out to support him? Lots of voters I talked to supporting Donald Trump said he, they, he was their first and only choice. Really interesting data points that may uh, come to life again in a uh, future general election if Donald Trump does become the nominee. Caitlin Huey Burns in Concord, New Hampshire. Thank you so much. Mums the ruling. Donald Trump's gag order stays in his criminal case related to the 2020 election. A D.C. federal appeals court refused to rehear Trump's appeal of the order. The former president was challenging an October ruling put in place by Judge Tanya Chutkin who is overseeing the election case. It bars Trump from making inflammatory statements against special counsel Jack Smith, possible witnesses, and others involved in the case. Trump appealed the order. It was upheld, and then Trump's team asked the court to reconsider, which they have now said they won't do. Trump's lawyers have previously indicated they could take the issue to the Supreme Court. A gunman accused of killing eight people outside Chicago this week is now dead. Police say 23-year-old Romeo Nance killed himself after a confrontation with U.S. Marshals at a gas station in San Antonio, Texas. Authorities believe he was attempting to reach the border. It's still unknown what the motive was for the killings in Chicago. Now to tensions overseas where the U.S. is now firing on Iranian-backed groups in Iraq. This military response came after an attack on a military base over the weekend that wounded U.S. service members. Charlie Daggett has the latest. 
U.S. Central Command say forces conducted unilateral strikes against three facilities used by Iranian-backed militias in Iraq, including headquarters, storage, and training locations. It's in response to repeated attacks, including one just a few days ago on the Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq, in a sustained missile and rocket bombardment that injured four U.S. service members. There have been more than 150 attacks against U.S. targets in the region by Iranian-backed militias since the war in Gaza began. Where today, the Israeli military said troops have now surrounded Gaza's second largest city of Khan Yunus. Residents there were burying more of their dead today. Survivors left to watch from a distance their city go up in flames. The Israeli advance comes as troops suffered their deadliest day since the conflict began. 24 soldiers killed, 21 in a single attack. The IDF spokesman said a blast struck the building they were prepping to detonate. (laughs) Families held funerals for the fallen today as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reiterated, we will not stop fighting until complete victory. Regarding those new strikes, the Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said the precision strikes were in direct response to a series of escalatory attacks against U.S. and coalition personnel, adding neither he nor the president will hesitate to take necessary action to defend them or U.S. interests. John? Charlie Daggett in Tel Aviv. Thank you, Charlie. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin took time to address the war in Ukraine in his first public appearance since being hospitalized. And the United States remains determined to support Ukraine in its fight for freedom. I urge this group to dig deep, to provide Ukraine with more life-saving ground-based air defense systems and interceptors. And Ukraine has answered Putin's cruelty with courage and defiance. Austin was expected to acknowledge his health in prepared remarks, but did not. He was hospitalized after suffering complications after a procedure to treat prostate cancer. He faced criticism after failing to alert the White House of his condition at a time of so many international hotspots. How close are we to doomsday? The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists revealed their answer today. We once again set the doomsday clock to express a continuing and unprecedented level of risk. It is 90 seconds to midnight. Midnight on the clock is meant to represent a hypothetical global catastrophe. The clock's position includes factors such as ongoing wars in Ukraine and Gaza, climate change, and advances in artificial intelligence. While the clock did not move forward this year, it still remains the closest of midnight since its inception in 1947. Adrian Beltry, Todd Helton, and Joe Maurer were elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame this evening. Beltry and Maurer were elected in their first year on the ballot, while Helton made it on his sixth. Combined, they had over 7,800 hits, 3,000 RBIs, and nearly 1,000 home runs throughout their careers. They will be inducted in July. We will go back to the live free or die state of New Hampshire. What some of our campaign reporters have been seeing during their time there. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. Welcome back to CBS News Primetime. I'm John Dickerson. Here are some additions to our top stories. 22 delegates are up for grabs in the Republican primary in New Hampshire, which is home to more than 870,000 registered voters. During Donald Trump's first presidential campaign, he won the primary there. Eight years later, recent polling shows Trump is still uh, a man with strong support in New Hampshire. His one and only opponent, Nikki Haley, is vowing to stay in the race regardless of tonight's outcome. Her home state of South Carolina holds its primary in about one month. We are also looking ahead to Nevada and Super Tuesday, where a total of 16 states will be voting. Campaign reporter Nydia Cavazos is on the ground in New Hampshire, and she joins us now. Nydia, thank you for being with us. You've been with Haley um, a fair, uh, well, for a very long time. How have you seen her campaign change from Iowa to this very moment? 
Yes, well, I've been covering the Nikki Haley campaign now almost daily since October. We've been to over 100 campaign events for Haley. And so I can definitely tell you that the mood is really different. There's a lot of enthusiasm and optimism be in between the Haley camp here. And it's very different from Iowa. With Iowa, you know, they were shy from having it, releasing any sort of expectations. And even before and after the event, we noticed the mood was just, um, you know, as the polls had expected, as the polls had been showing, Haley ended up being in third. But coming into New Hampshire, the expectation is that she's going to perform a lot stronger. And now, of course, we've asked numerous, numerous times their, from their campaign, we've pressed Haley so many times as well to help us define what a success and what does a win look like her look for her tonight. But she has not said any sort of numbers. She's actually said she's not going to be getting into the numbers, into the percentages, but she's just expecting a high voter turnout for her and to perform a lot stronger than Iowa so that she can have that momentum to carry on to her home state of South Carolina. What have you noticed in the candidate herself during this week uh, when it comes down to being just a two-person race, sometimes in the challenger, uh, there's a little more quickness in the step, a little bit more uh, excitement in the candidate. Has there been anything in uh, the ambassador's demeanor that you've noticed that's changed in the last week? Yes, we can definitely see many, many changes, but among the most notable and, and the most notable changes is that for months, Haley would be pressed by voters on why she, why she wasn't exactly, you know, speaking out against former President Trump. And she was always very cautious with her responses. She would give short answers, just saying, you know, she doesn't focus on her competitors. She's just here to talk about her policy, actual issues. and a focus on moving the country forward. But fast forward now to New Hampshire and the fact that this is a two-person race, she began touting this even when she placed third place, when she was at third place in Iowa and she came in after DeSantis. She was already declaring this a two-person race and with this came the changes in her demeanors, in her answers and in her attacks against former President Donald Trump. She was much more open about it to the point that voters were not necessarily pressing her on, you know, attacking former President Trump. She made it very clear that Trump is her opponent and that she's all in. And so we've seen this in the ads. We've seen this in her campaign stops. It's over and over again that she mentions Trump. And Nidia, briefly before we go, anything you've noticed from your time in the Granite State uh, about the voters or just the feel of the, the politics there? You were just out in Iowa. What's it been like out in New, in New Hampshire? Well, I can say for one, the weather here has been completely yeah, a different contrast to Iowa. In Iowa during caucus night, we were at, we could have called this a sub-zero election. We were below zero temperatures. And coming into New Hampshire, I never would have thought that I would have said that weather in 20 degrees was amazing, was a lot warmer. I'm from Texas. I do not like the cold. We don't drive in snow. You know, when it snows in Texas, the entire state shuts down. So we can definitely tell that the weather here is a lot better. And it's also playing into this election. You know, in Iowa, we would say that it was going to represent the wild card. Many people were not going to necessarily go out in dangerous conditions, but here in New Hampshire, that's not a factor in it. So, you know, I can say that the snow has definitely been a memorable uh, situation here in New Hampshire. Welcome to the campaign trail. It's going to get warmer in South Carolina. Nidia Cavazos, thank you. Nikki Haley has said no matter what happens in New Hampshire, she plans to stay in the race. One of the next key contests is next month in her home state of South Carolina. Tareen Small joins me now from the Palmetto State. Tareen, what are you hearing from voters about their feelings about the former governor? Yeah, so I've been here since the weekend, and I've been taking the temperature of voters out here in South Carolina. Quite a few of them are mixed on uh, the former governor here. Uh, they say that, you know, the folks who are backing Donald Trump are, you know, in line with a lot of the opinions of voters from Iowa. They think that he's fighting for them. He, they believe that he's being unfairly prosecuted and persecuted. Um, and they think that ultimately he has the best shot at beating Donald Trump or at beating uh, Joe Biden in a general election matchup. They also touted his impressive win over the rest of the field in Iowa that ultimately led to quite a few of his primary rights to drop out. When it comes to Nikki Haley, though, uh, the folks who are interested in her the most are the never Trumpers or the folks who are willing to move on from Donald Trump, even though they voted for him in the past two elections. So does it seem more that they are uh, supporting her because they don't like Donald Trump? Uh, wh wh where's the home state love? She was their governor. <laughs> 
I mean, I, I think that's a question that we should also ask the current U.S. Senator, uh, Tim Scott, who also endorsed Donald Trump instead of Nikki Haley. Listen, uh, a lot of people are looking at the polls and are reading the writing on the wall. I even talked to Republican leadership, uh, the state party here, that say that, you know, it's unlikely that this could be uh, a long contest because they're looking at the margin uh, of what happens in New Hampshire about whether or not she'll have uh, a longer run in this race. But like you said, Nikki Haley said she's going to stick it through New, uh, New Hampshire to South Carolina. She's also vying for Super Tuesday. She just invested about $4 million in uh, TV spending here mm -hmm. in South Carolina. She has her eyes set on a long run. Not too many folks, uh, at least in the state Republican Party level here, uh, believe that that might be the case. And I believe Senator Tim Scott, who just endorsed Trump, was appointed to his Senate post by Nikki Haley when she was governor, which is colder than it is. That's cold. Colder than New Hampshire. Let me ask you this final question, Tureen. Um, <laughs> is, uh, Nikki Haley, has, her campaign has mentioned that, um, that, that, that voters can participate who are Democrats or independents, or not registered, I should say. What signal does that send uh, from her campaign? Yeah, John, it's certainly an interesting strategy. It's one that we've seen her adopt in uh, Iowa and New Hampshire. In Iowa, we saw her make the pitch to independents, to uh, Democrats, to you know, participate in the caucuses and the Republican caucuses because it is legal technically. In New Hampshire, she's made that same pitch. She said, hey, participate, join our cause. And, and she's moved from this more hard right conservative voice to one that opens up a wider tent to more moderates. Uh, here in South Carolina, I tried to take the pulse of uh, voters out here if they're interested in that. I talked to a few Democrats actually about that pitch, about, you know, participating in the open primary to vote for Haley. Uh, I talked to some voters in Iowa who said the reason why they would do that is to stop Trump. I see, tried to see if they're on the same page here. They're not interested. The interested. Democrats that I talked to say that they're in, they're supporting Joe Biden. They're uninterested in any Republican at this point. That's interesting. Thank you for that reporting, Toreen Small in South Carolina. Besides South Carolina, we're also looking ahead to Nevada, which holds its primary and caucuses, you heard me right, in about two weeks. Jessica Hill joins us now. She's a politics reporter with the Las Vegas Review Journal. So Nevada, Nevada, excuse me, I didn't mispronounce it. Nevada has a primary and a caucus. Why? Yes. It is confusing. A lot of voters, especially Republican voters, are confused and frustrated about this. We have, so February 6th, we have a state-run primary. Uh, in 2021, legislators, Democratic legislators, pushed to end caucuses and put in uh, primaries. The Republican Party, however, did not like that, and they decided to hold a caucus regardless. Um, so now we have two dueling nominating processes. However, because the Nevada Republican Party gets to choose which process holds the most weight, uh, the primary is left to be more symbolic and just for a show. Um, the only people that are really participating in it, in, in it is uh, Nikki Haley and then some other people um, who are kind of lower names. Um, and then in the caucus, Donald Trump is really the only Republican uh, of note worth, of note that uh, is participating in the caucus. Um, Vivek Ramaswamy and DeSantis have since dropped out, so it's really just him. So, Jessica, the delegates, as I understand, as I understand, the delegates are going to be apportioned by the caucus, which which Nikki Haley is not participating in, and so the primary ballot, which doesn't include Donald Trump, isn't really even a proper show, right? Because it's not a head-to-head -head with Haley and Trump. Correct. Yes. We think maybe Nikki Haley could use the primary to show, like, look at the public support that I have. Um, however, it won't really mean anything and she won't be able to get receive any delegates here in Nevada. Yes. She's turned it into a one person race, but that's not very right. useful in the end. OK, so if the voting doesn't matter much, what are what are folks talking about in Nevada that they actually care about in terms of either the Republican race or just in general and that you hear about in your reporting? Yeah, so a big thing that I'm hearing about right now, just leading up to the primary and the caucus, is the confusion. And a lot of Republicans are saying this is a disaster that the Republican Party is facing. Uh, Republicans are also worried of what this could mean for turnout in November. Um, the Nevada Republican Party, who is run by some of the fake electors uh, that submitted fake electoral certificates for Donald Trump, uh, have been touting some false claims of election security issues and claiming that their caucus will be more secure um, and therefore you shouldn't participate in the elections. And some other Republicans fear that that could not bode well for uh, November and 
uh, electing Republicans up and down the ballot. Um, besides elections, um, another big issue here is abortion. You know, here in Nevada, it's protected in state law. Uh, however, some people fear that uh, electing someone on a national level could outdo or overdo those um, laws by passing any national restrictions. So Democrats uh, remain really focused on hitting the abortion issue because that's uh, proved to be successful for them in the past. Um, and then another big issue is education. Nevada has one of the lowest ranked education systems, and we're constantly looking for ways to improve that. Nevada will be a battleground state. And so, Jessica Hill, we thank you now, and we're going to be talking to you again, I'm sure. Thanks again. Thanks. We're going to have more coverage of the New Hampshire primary coming up, but first we'll check in on the cleanup efforts following severe weather out west. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. 7.45 here on the East Coast, and polls in New Hampshire close in about 15 minutes. We'll have results in the next hour. Parts of Southern California have started recovery efforts after heavy rain battered the region. San Diego was hit especially hard. Hundreds of people had to be rescued, and Jonathan Vigliotti is on the ground. Tonight, storm-battered San Diego is cleaning up a massive mess. This event that happened yesterday was unprecedented more than anything we've ever seen. The city, known for its sandy beaches, now covered in muck and debris after yesterday's record rainfall plunged neighborhoods into chaos. How fast is it rising at this point? It's going really fast. Maritza Ramirez and her family raced to the attic, but the water just kept coming. My like, fear was just like drowning in the attic. So they climbed onto the roof and waited hours to be rescued. I was just like, what are we gonna do? We can't go into the water, the water's dirty, the water's deep. We feel helpless, we were barefoot cold, stuck on the roof. Emergency responders struggled as they went door to door, rescuing more than 100 trapped residents using kayaks and stretchers. You can see the water line around. Jessica Calise was like not was home when chest deep water destroyed nearly everything inside. When you walked in for the first time and you saw this, what looks like the inside of a washing machine, what went on in your head? I mean, absolute like shock and disbelief. I've never seen anything like this. And cars like this show the power of this storm. And tonight, there's a long road to recovery ahead. According to FEMA, just one inch of flood water can cost more than $25,000 in damage. In this neighborhood, the water reached more than five feet high, John. Jonathan Vigliotti in San Diego. Thank you. While parts of California clean up, parts of the South are bracing for their own bout of severe rain. And for more on that, here's meteorologist Chris Warren from our partners at the Weather Channel. Tracking a lot of rain and some thunderstorms that have the potential for being severe in the coming days. So some damaging storms possible to go along with what could be some flash flooding tomorrow. Severe weather possible from Corpus Christi all the way to central Mississippi and parts of Alabama. As far as that flood threat goes, all of the repeated rounds of rain and heavy rain and thunderstorms will mean that in yellow, not just possible, but it's likely somewhere in there tomorrow into Thursday morning, there's going to be some flash flooding. High resolution future radar shows when it looks like the rain's about to, to come to an end, but there's more behind it. And you can kind of see that here. There's the big line and then more rain there in East Texas back into Louisiana again with soaking rain continuing in Alabama and Georgia, some of the Carolinas, especially some of the mountainous areas. Meanwhile, as we watch this area of high pressure, it's moving to the east, bringing in some of that moisture, going to be seeing some above average temperature uh, readings here in the coming days as well. And for more in-depth coverage, watch the Weather Channel on cable and live on your favorite TV streaming device. Chris Warren, thank you. Here at CBS News, we're mourning the loss of Charles Osgood, the former longtime anchor of CBS Sunday Morning. He died today at age 91. Our Jane Pauley looks back at his life. Good morning. I'm Charles Osgood, and this is Sunday Morning. He was the admired, yet approachable host of Sunday Morning for more than 22 years. Leave the Pennsylvania. Charles Osgood knew his was a storied life. Born Charles Osgood Wood in the Bronx. He grew up in Baltimore. He remembered it this way. In 1942, milk was delivered in bottles. The mail was delivered twice a day. And that boy named Charlie Wood had a paper route. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. 
He had a love of music and time spent chewing the fat with the likes of Julia Child. Did you imagine that you were a natural for television when you first started doing that show? I'm a natural ham with them helps a lot. And many others. They come out fast, but I mean, it's a fast world. We have actors and artists, not just politicians. His beloved Sunday morning was the beneficiary of his passions. Our Sunday mornings are filled with such things. It feels great to be part of something that people love, and I know that they do. I've sung this song, but I'll sing it again. I knew I'd be leaving, but I didn't know when. He is survived by Jean, his wife of 50 years, their five children and six grandchildren, and all of us at CBS News. Been a long time. Charles Osgood was 91 years old. And I've got to be drifting along. Ahead, we'll go back to New Hampshire, where CBS News spoke to some voters about their preferences and what matters most to them. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. Most New Hampshire voters have now cast their ballots ahead of the 8 p.m. poll closures. But earlier today, CBS News anchor Nora O'Donnell interviewed three Granite State primary voters about how they decided between Nikki Haley and former President Donald Trump. I'm a registered Republican. I'm voting for Nikki Haley. I'm a registered Independent, and I voted for Nikki Haley. Registered Republican and voting for Donald Trump. Paige, you're in college. You're the president of the student government? Yeah. Why Nikki Haley over Donald Trump? I think she's a little more moderate compared to Trump. In terms of her views, she talks about cutting back spending, gun control, things like that. In terms of having to pick the lesser of two evils, I think that's what it came down to. And Jamie, what, what leads you to vote for Donald Trump? I think he did a good four years in, in 16. I think he ran the country. Um, the way it should have been run. I think it was a strong military. I think the economy was great. I think it worked for everybody. And I think he deserves another chance. What's the most important issue to you? Immigration for me. I think that's just a huge issue. I think that's a huge draw on the system. I think someone who's going to look out for rural America, somebody who cares about the needs of the small business owners and people on Main Street. Age has become a focus mm -hmm. in this race. Does age concern you? Yeah, I think it's a concern probably for everybody, but I, if, I, if you contrast the two, I think they're, it's night and day. What are some of the most important issues for young voters? I would say definitely the environment. Um, gun control comes up a lot, but I would say overall health care. It's the economy and it's immigration first. All, all these other things matter, but you have got to get your house in order. We've got to get back to listening to people on the ground, hearing their concerns, and then building consensus around policies to move our country forward. I mean, but you can't change what people want to see. You can't change what's fun or interesting for them to look at. And that's the trouble that candidates have been having running against Donald Trump. He has a fun show. And so if you go in there as kind of a wonky, you know, talking about policy and whatever, you know, yeah. where's the party at? Right. No, I, you're right. But that's something we have to get past in this country. It will happen. Thankfully, we all live in the United States where we're lucky to probably have a few political ideologies and it to swing back and forth over our lifetime. Not too many people across the world have that opportunity or that chance. Up next, Nora O'Donnell and Major Garrett lead a special edition of America Decides as results from New Hampshire start to come in. And I'll be back at 10 for a late edition of CBS News Primetime. For all of us here in the newsroom, thank you for spending the hour with us.